in the dark shadows, in the white cold. Fearlessly we search for knowledge new and old. We drink the strong spirits and read the ancient tomes. The order of the Abracast. We are the brave and the bold. The Coming Insurrection by the Invisible Committee. The Fifth Circle. Fewer possessions, more connections. Thirty years of crisis, mass unemployment, and flagging growth. And they still want us to believe in the economy. Thirty years punctuated, it is true, by delusionary interludes. The interlude of 1981 to 1983, when we were deluded into thinking a government of the left might make the people better off. The, quote, easy money, unquote. The interlude of 1986 to 89, when we were all supposed to be playing the market and getting rich. The internet interlude of 1998 to 2001, when everyone was going to get a virtual career through being well-connected, when a diverse but united France, cultural and multicultural, would bring home every World Cup. But here we are. We've drained our own supply of delusions, and we've hit rock bottom, and are totally broke and buried in debt. The Abracast, occult, history, conspiracy, and violence. Recording this evening straight from a bombed out, flaming, gated community with only my M16 and my pink polo shirt to defend me. I'm John Towers and this is the Abercast. I've been spending a lot of time in the studio this week. I uh, had to do the exclusive Fellow Craft episode for Patreon and Subscribestar. And, um... So that was like an extra show to squeeze in. And I'm going out of town again this weekend. So trying to do Sunday's episode. And then I'm still trying to get through this coming instruction. I think we got two episodes left, including this one. And I like, I want to hurry up and get it all done before all this craziness starts. <laughs> what do you mean in November? So, um, we are, we've been working on the coming insurrection for a while. And then uh, we kind of took a break from it to talk to uh, Trevor Loudon about the secret origins of Antifa. And then we had to do an episode on the uh, Chinese Cultural Revolution. All these things are completely 100% relevant in the current events of the day. So I'm just trying to keep up, bro. I was just trying to keep up. Anyhow, this is going to be the third episode this week, so I thought... This would be a great time to chip another one of these coming insurrection episodes in the bucket, in the can, whatever they call it. <laughs> uh, I originally thought that I was being a little too heavy handed with all this anarchist communist stuff, but I've gotten a little bit of a, a couple words of encouragement from some listeners out there saying things like, we're not hearing this anywhere else in the podcast in the pod averse so i was like all right then fuck it we're gonna keep going we're gonna keep going so here we go um uh man a few editorial words this evening i just want to get to this we're gonna be talking about probably the fifth and sixth circle of the coming insurrection speaking of the trevor loudon stuff 
and the cultural revolution stuff and the coming insurrection stuff. I just want to give a shout out. We did a bunch of, um, I put a bunch of resources in the newsletter. You can get it when you sign into the newsletter, obviously you get the newsletter, but if you're trying to play catch up with it, there's a section of the website you can only get to if you have the the link that's in the newsletter. So there's a ton of resources up there I found. Well, I posted a free PDF version of the coming insurrection if you want to read along. But I found um, the sort of Black Lives Matter kind of answer to the coming insurrection. It's called, uh, it's called, it's going down, burn down the... American plantation or something like that. That's on there. They'll give you a lot of context about what we're talking about. And then the Syrian revolution thing came up with Trevor Loudon. So I posted an article about that specifically, if you want to be interested in it along with this hand to hand with this hand in hand, hand in glove with this is uh, we have a vessel of the art supporter on Patreon named Matt. And Matt has been keeping a very close eye on the geopolitical situation, especially in China, 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 China. And if you um listening to any of these episodes, specifically the Trevor Loudon episode, you might understand why that is Im- important. Anyhow, Matt has curated a list of very recent links all about the stressors that are going on in the world right now. And China, China, China is coming up on a lot, on a lot of them. So if you sign into the mailing list, you get Matt's uh, curated list there. I think I called it Matt's game of global domination or something like that. But uh, he's a great dude and he's really been keeping an eye on this stuff through the the pandemic. So if you're interested in this sort of stuff, but you don't feel like searching around for it, just, it's going to be right there. It's going to be a running feature as far as I know on the mailing list. So thanks. Shout out to Matt for that. And you know, tarot cards are available. There's new t-shirts up, uh, you know, all that stuff. Patreon, subscribe star. Okay. The fifth circle. Fewer possessions and more connections. I already did the first paragraph on the cold open. So just picking up right from there. If we have to see that the economy is not in crisis, the economy is itself the crisis. It is not that there's not enough work. It's that there is too much of it. All things considered... It is not the crisis that depresses us. It's the growth. We must admit that the litany of stock market prices moves us about as much as a Latin mass. Luckily for us, there are quite a few of us who have come to this conclusion. We are not talking about those who live off of various scams and who deal in this or that or who have been on welfare in the last 10 years or of all those who no longer find their identity in their jobs and live for their time off. Nor are we talking about those who've been swept under the rug, the hidden ones who make do with the least and yet outnumber the rest. All those stuck by this strange mass detachment, adding to the ranks of retirees and the cynical, overexploited, flexible workforce. We're not talking about them, although they to should in one way or another arrive at similar conclusions. We are talking about all of the countries, indeed entire continents that have lost faith in the economy, either because they've seen the IMF come and go amid crashes and enormous losses, or because they've gotten a taste of the world bank, the soft crisis of vocation, that the West is now experiencing is completely absent in these places. What is happening in Guinea, Russia, Argentina, and Bolivia is a violent and long lasting debunking of this religion and its clergy. What do you call a thousand IMF economists lying at the bottom of the sea? Went the joke at the world bank 
It was a good start. The Russian joke. Two economists meet and one asks the other, you understand what's happening? And the other responds, wait, I'll explain it to you. No, no, says the first. Explaining is no problem. I am an economist too. What I'm asking you is, do you understand it? <laughs> Entire sections of this clergy pretend to be dissidents and to critique the religion's dogma. Latest attempt, the latest attempts to uh, revive the so-called science of economy is a current and straight facedly refers to itself as post autistic eco economics <laughs> um, making a living from dismantling the you you certations slights of hand and cooked books of science whose only tangible function is to rattle the monstrance during the vociferations of the chiefs giving their demands for submission a bit of ceremony and ultimately doing what religions have always done provide explanations for the general misery becomes intolerable the moment it is shown for what it is a thing without cause or reason nobody respects money anymore Neither those who have it or those who don't. When asked what they want to be someday, 20% of young Germans answer, I want to be an art artist. Visa was an artist. Work is no longer endured as a giving of the human condition. The accounting departments of corporations confess that they have no idea where value comes from. The market's bad reputation would have done it in decades ago if not for the bluster and the fury, not to mention the deep pockets of its apologists. It is common sense now to see progress as synonymous with disaster in the world of the economic. Everything is in flight. And just like the USSR over and drop off, he was the general secretary of the commie party of the Soviet Union from 82 to 84. He was preceded by Gorbachev, Gorbachev, who had that fucking thing on his face. He looks like he had a Kool-Aid stain on his forehead. Anyone who has spent a little time analyzing the final years of the USSR knows very well that the pleas for goodwill coming from our rulers, all of their fantasies about some future that has disappeared without a trace, all of their professions of faith in reforming this and that are just the first fissures in the structure of the wall. The collapse of the socialist bloc. <laughs> the collapse of the socialist bloc was in no way a victory of capitalism. It was uh, merely the breakdown of one of the forms capitalism takes. Besides, the demise of the USSR could not come about because a people revolted, but because the Norman culture of undergoing a changeover when it was proclaimed the end of socialism I saw a small fraction of the ruling class emancipated itself from the anarchistic duties that still bound it to the people and they took a private control of what was already controlled in the name of, quote, everyone, unquote. In the factories, the joke went, we pretend to work and they pretend to pay us. The oligarchy replied, there was no point. Let's stop pretending they ended up with the raw materials, the industrial infrastructure, the military industrial complex, the banks and the nightclubs, and everyone else got poverty or immigration. Just as no one in Andropov's time believed in the USSR, no one in the meeting halls, the workshops, and the offices believes in France today. There is no point, responded the bosses and political leaders who no longer even bother to smooth the edges of the iron laws of economy. They strip factories in the middle of the night and announce the shutdown early next morning. 
They no longer hesitate to send in anti-terrorism units to shut down a strike, as was done with the ferries and the occupied recycling centers in Rennes. The brute. Uh, the brutal activity of power today consists both of administrating this ruin while at the same time establishing the framework of a new economy. So I'm just going to, I need to pause here to take a moment. I know I just said like man with few editorial words for this episode, but the, this um, critique or this worldview of history is poisonous he this saying that the fall of the soviet union was not um a victory for capitalism is a straight up lie it's a lie and i could uh go on and on for probably Oh, maybe and I should, maybe and I should go on for hours about uh, the fall of the Soviet Union. You know, we've done, we've touched on Cold War stuff for sure. I feel like I got a real good handle on it. And this view of it is, it's an apologetics for socialism. He wants to say apologetics. This is him going, it's not that socialism is bad. It's just that the USSR got too far away from socialism and that's why it failed. This is this, um, Jesus, I don't know how I should describe it. I mean, there's so many ways, you know, Colonel Harry Potter would say it's horse pucky. That's from mash kids. That's a deep cut. You're like Harry Potter was a Colonel. What are you talking about with his wand and stuff? Anyhow, here, I'm, uh, if you're like, what is this guy yammering on about the Cold War? Go check out Bill Whittle's What We Saw, the Cold War. Um, it's, it's fascinating. It's a fascinating look on the difference, the stark difference, the flip of the, the two sides of the coin of communism and capitalism. And he gets into depth about what happened there at the end. I don't feel like redoing the whole guy's podcast. So, you know, maybe I won't talk about the end of the cold war, but, um, Bill Whittle, what we saw the cold war, it just ended, uh, I don't know, maybe a month or two ago, please go check it out. If you're interested in all this communism stuff. It's very interesting, especially the last episode, <laughs> like Gorbachev, uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union, Gorbachev started to star in Pizza Hut commercials. <laughs> That's glasnost for you, Gorbachev. All right, back to the fifth circle. And yet we had gone, gotten, and yet we had gotten used to the economy. For generations, we were disciplined, pacified, and made into subjects productive by nature and content to consume. And suddenly everything that we were determined to forget is revealed that the economy is political. Huh? Boy, tell me about it, brother. Let's just shut it down for a few, for a few months. Um, boy, whew, looking at this thing is just crazy. And that this uh, politics is today a politics of selection within a humanity that has largely become superfluous from Colbert de Gaulle to de Gaulle by way of Napoleon III. The state has always treated the economic as political and as as the bourgeoisie who profit from it and the proletariat who confront it. All that is left is this strange middling part of the population, the curious and the powerless aggregate of those who take no sides, the petty bourgeoisie. They have always pretended to believe in the economy as a reality because their neutrality is safe there. Small business owners, small bosses, minor bureaucrats, managers, professional, 
professors, journalists, middlemen of every sort make up this non-class in France. This social gelatin composed of the mass of all those who just want to live their little private stupid lives at a distance from history and its tumults. This swamp is now predisposed to be the champion of false consciousness, half asleep and always ready to close its eyes on the war that rages around it. Each clarification of a front in this war is thus accompanied in France by the invention of some new fad, the hula hoop, the frisbee. I added that <laughs> for the past 10 years, it was. ATTAC, which is the Associates for the Taxation of Financial Transactions for the Aid of Citizens, is a non-party political organization that advocates. Okay, if it's non, if it's a non-party political organization, why does it advocate social democratic reforms, particularly to the Tobin tax on the international foreign exchange intended to curtail currency speculation at the at uh, and funds social policy. And it's a pro appropriable Tobin tax, the tax whose implementation would require nothing less than a global government with its sympathy for the real economy, as opposed to the financial markets, not to mention its touch touching nostalgia for the state. The comedy lasts only so long before turning into a masquerade. And then another fad replaces it. So we have negative growth. Whereas ATTAC, I want to keep calling it attack, tried to save economics as a science. With its popular education courses, negative growth would preserve it as a morality. There is... Only one alternative of the coming apocalypse, reduce growth, consume and produce less, become joyously frugal, eat organic, ride your bike, stop smoking and play clo pay close attention to the products you buy. Be content with the strictly necessary Voluntary simplicity. Rediscover true wealth as the blossoming of convivial social relations in a healthy world. Don't use up our natural capital. Work towards a healthy economy. I mean, it's right here. The, the slogan is right here between the words, right? No regulation through chaos. Avoid a social crisis that would threaten democracy and humanism. Simply put, get economical. Go back to daddy's economy. To the golden age of the petty bourgeoisie, the 50s, when the individual is frugal, property service, uh, it's function perfectly which is to allow the individual to enjoy his or her own life sheltered from public existence in the private sanctuary of his or her life. A graphic designer wearing a handmade sweater is drinking a fruity cocktail with some friends on the terrace of an ethnic cafe. They're chatty and cordial and they joke around a bit. They make sure not to be too loud or too quiet. They smile at each other a little blissfully. We are so civilized. Afterwards, some of them go to work in the neighborhood community garden, while others will dabble in pottery, some Zen Buddhism, or in the making of an animated film. <laughs> they find communion in the smug feeling that they constitute a new humanity. They are wiser and more redefined than the previous one. And they are right. There is a curious agreement between Apple and the negative growth movement about the civilization of the future and some people's idea of returning to the economy of yesteryear offers, offers others the convenient screen behind which the great technological leap forward can be launched 
for in history there is no going back. Any exoration to return to the past is only the expression of one form of consciousness of the present, and rarely the least modern. It is not uh, the chance of negative growth is the banner of the dissident advertisers of the magazine Cosors de Pub. It's the French equivalent to ad busters. <laughs> the invention of zero growth, the club of Rome in 1972, where themselves a group of industrialists and bureaucrats who relied on a research paper written by cyberneticians at MIT. This convergence is hardly a coincidence. It is part of a forced march towards a modernized economy. Capitalism has got much as it could from undoing all the old social ties. It is now in the process of remaking itself by rebuilding these same ties on its own terms. Contemporary metropolitan social life is its incubator. In the same way, it has ravaged the nat natural world, and it is now taken with the crazy notion of reconstituting nature, as so many controlled environments furnished with all the necessary sensors, the new humanity requires a new economy that would no longer be separate spheres of existence, but would rather be the very tissue the raw material of human relations. It requires a new definition of work as work on oneself, a new definition of capital as human capital. That sounds awful. The new idea of production as production of relations and consumption of the consumption of situations. And above all, a new idea of value that would encompass all of the qualities of being. This burgeoning bioeconomy conceives the planet as a closed system to be managed and claims to establish the foundations for a science that would integrate all of the parameters. Listen to this. I, while I'm finishing reading this sentence, you guys are probably already ahead of me. I've had a drink or two. You guys are probably already a couple steps ahead of me on this, but look, I'm catching on. As I'm finishing reading this, what I want you to be thinking of is the social scoring system in China. Um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, think of that Black Mirror episode with what's her face? Richie Cunningham's daughter, Bryce Dallas. Howard, you know who I'm talking about? So Black Mirror did a whole episode. I think it was the last season that they did um, where this person's now, this isn't tied into her credit score. This is her social score. But in China, it's they have a social credit scoring system. And the way that I imagine it is it's awful. Like anyone that like scans you or something can like tell what your credit score is. Like what your maybe what your social rating is, which is what the Black Mirror episode was all about. Like every interaction this lady has with someone, they get to like thumbs up or thumbs down or rate her in some way, and it becomes like this social mannerism. It's like tipping. It's like she goes for a coffee and something happens, and like the lady who serves her the coffee is like, well, fuck that bitch, and like gives her like two stars or something instead of three stars. I haven't seen it in a long time, okay? Just, just stick with me. Uh, and so this whole day that she's having cascades down on on her, and her, her score starts spiraling, all because of like this one it all started with like this one bit that she had happen at the beginning of her day and like her best friend or whatever, who has like a super high social status, um, invites her to be the maid of honor at her wedding because it's like, it'll reflect well on her as an act of charity to help, you know, only a three star person be her, you know, who, and she's a five star person. Um, you know, and she's coaching her into like talking about like this stuffed animal or some shit anyhow. Let me, okay. So if you haven't seen her, you don't know what I'm talking about. That's pretty, <laughs> it's probably a pretty shitty recap of the episode, but it's got what I need you to understand in there. 
So I'm going to finish reading this and just keep that kind of shit in mind. This uh, Chinese social score. Uh, I'm going to back up a little bit. It requires a new definition of work as work on oneself, a new definition of capital as human capital, a new idea of production as the production of relations and consumptions of the consumption of situations. And above all, the new idea of value that would encompass all of the qualities of being the burgeoning bio economy conceives the planet as a closed system to be managed and claim and claims to establish the foundations for a science that would integrate all parameters of life. And such a science could make us miss the good old days when unreliable indices like G- GDP growth were supposed to measure the well-being of a people, but at last no one believed in them revalorize the non-economic aspect of life is the slogan shared by negative growth movement and by the capitals reform program eco villages video surveillance cameras spirituality biotechnologies and the sociability all belongs to the same civilization paradigm now taking shape that of a total economy rebuilt from the ground up its intellectual matrix is none other than the cybernetics of science and the systems that is the science of their control he's talking about these two things like it's different you see what i'm saying these two things that he's talking about are not different they're they're the same fucking thing In the 17th century, in order to impose the economic system and its ethos of work and greed in a definitive way, it is necessary to confine, to eliminate the whole seamy mess of layabout liars, witches and madmen, scoundrels and all other vagrant poor. I'm going to drink to that. Witches, madmen and scoundrels, layabouts and liars, here's to you. Oh, here's also to my Patreon supporters and my subscribe star supporters. I forgot to thank you at the opening of the show. Not saying that those people are layabouts, liars, witches, madmen, and scoundrels. I think there are a few witches, madmen, and scoundrels, though. The whole humanity whose very existence gave the lie to the order of interest and restraint, the new economy cannot be established without a similar selection of subjects and zones singled out for transformation. The chaos that will constantly hear about will either provide the opportunity for the selection or for our victory over this odious project. Learn more at abracast.com. Get bonus content by signing up for the mailing list. Get all that plus many exclusive episodes by supporting the show at patreon.com or subscribestar.com. All right, let's pick right back up here. Where were we? Aha. The sixth circle. The environment is an industrial challenge. Ecology is the discovery of the decade. For the last 30 years, we've left it up to the environmentalists, joking about it on Sunday so that we can act concerned again on Monday. And now it's caught up to us, invading the airwaves like a hit song in the summertime because it's 68 degrees in September. One quarter of the fish species has disappeared from the ocean. Cue the environmental alarmism. (laughs) Ding, ding, ding. (laughs) Al Gore, your office is calling. The rest won't last much longer. Bird flu alert. We are given assurances that hundreds of thousands of migrating birds will be shot from the sky. 
mercury levels in the human breast milk are 10 times higher than the legal level for cows. And these lips, which swell up after I bite the apple, but it is came from the farmer's market. The simplest gestures have become toxic. One dies at the age of 35 from a prolonged illness that is to be managed just like one manages everything else. We should have seen it coming before we got to this place. To Ward B of the Palliative Care Center. We have to admit it, the whole catastrophe which they so noisily inform us about doesn't really touch us. At least not until we are hit by one of its foreseeable consequences. It may concern us, but it doesn't touch us. And that is the real catastrophe. There is no environmental catastrophe. That catastrophe is the environment itself. Hmm. I see a, <laughs> I see a banner for me. The environment is what's left to man after he's lost everything. Those who live in a neighborhood, a street, a valley, a war zone, a workshop, they don't have an environment. They move through a world peopled by presence dangers, friends, enemies, moments of life and death of all kinds of beings. Such a world has its own consistency, which varies accordingly to the intensity and the quality of the ties attaching us to all of these beings, to all of these places. It's only we, the children of the final dispossession, exiles of the final hour, who come into the world in concrete cubes, pick our fruit at the supermarket and watch for an echo of the world on television. Only we get to have an environment. And there is no one but us to witness our own annihilation. As if it were just a simple change of scenery to get indignant about the last progress of this disaster to patiently compile its encyclopedia. What has congealed as an environment in relationship to the world based on management, which is to say on estrangement, a relationship to the world wherein we are not made of just as much of the rustling trees, the smell of frying oil in the building, running water, the hubbub of uh, schoolrooms, the mugginess of a summer evening, a relationship to the world where there is me and then there is my environment surrounding me, but never really con constituting me. We have become neighbors in a planetary board meeting. It is difficult to manage, uh, imagine a more complete hell. No material habitat has ever deserved the name environment, except perhaps the metropolis of today. The digitized voices making announcements, streetcars with such a 21st century whistle, bluish street lamps shaped like giant matchsticks, pedestrians done up like failed fashion models, the silent rotation of a video sur surveillance camera. Video surveillance cameras usually oscillate. They don't quite rotate. That's my editorial. The lucid clicking of the subway turnstile supermarket checkouts, office time clocks, the electronic ambiance of the cyber cafe, the profusion of plasma screens, express lanes, and latex. Single-serving meals, single-serving friends. No, I call it single-serving because, it, yeah, 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 I get it. Never has a setting been so able to do without than souls traversing it. Never has a milieu been more automatic. Never has a context been so indifferent and demanded in return. Is a price of survival, such an equal indifference from us. Ultimately, the environment is nothing more than the relationship to the world that is proper to the metropolis and that projects itself onto everything that would escape it. 
The situation is like this. They hired our parents to destroy this world. And now they'd like us to put a, to put us to work rebuilding it and to add insult to injury at a profit. The morbid excitement that animates journalists and advertisers these days as the report each of a new proof of global warming reveal the steely smile of the new green capitalism the making since the seventies, which we expected at the turn of the century, but it never came. Well, here it is, bitch. <laughs> it is sustainability, alternate, alternative solutions. That's it too. The health of the planet demands it. No doubt about it anymore. The green scene, the environment will be the new pivot of the 21st century political economy. A new volley of industrial solutions come with each new catastrophic possibility. The inventor of the H-bomb, Edward Teller, proposes shooting millions of tons of metallic dust into the stratosphere to stop global warming. NASA, frustrated at having to shelve its idea of anti-missile shield in the Museum of the Cold War horrors, suggests installing a gigantic mirror beyond the moon's orbit to protect us from the sun's now fatal rays. Another vision of the future, a motorized humanity driving in a bioethanol uh, from Sao Paulo. To Stockholm, the dream of cereal growers the world over. For it means to be converting all of the planet's arable lands into soy and sugar beet fields, e eco friendly cars, clean energy in the environment, consulting coexist painlessly with the latest channel Chanel ad at the pages of the glossy magazines. We are told that the environment has incomparable merit of being the first truly global problem presented to humanity. Global problem. Which is to say a problem that only those who are organized on a global level will be able to solve. And we know who they are. These are the very same groups that for close to a century have been the vanguard of disaster and certainly intended to remain so for the small price of a change of logo. The EDF, which is the uh, Electricity de France, the main electricity generation and distribution company in France, and one of the largest in the world, supplying most of its power from nuclear reactors. They had the impudence to trot out its nuclear program as the new solution of the global energy crisis goes to show how much the new solutions resemble the old problems from secretaries of state to the back rooms of alternative cafes. Concerns are always expressed in the same words, the same as they've always been. We have to get mobilized this time. It is not to rebuild the country like in the post-war era, not for the Ethiopians, like in the 80s, not for employment in the 90s. No, this time it's for the environment. Here we go. Ding, ding, ding. It's thanks for thanks you for your participation. Al Gore and the negative growth movement stand side by side with the eternal great souls of the Republic to do their part in reinvigorating the little people of the left and the well-known idealism of youth. Voluntary austerity writ large on their banner. They work benevolently to get us ready for the coming ecological state of emergency. So let me just point out real quick. These people are to the left of Al Gore. So let's just take a moment to appreciate that observation. <laughs> globular sticky mass of the guilt lands on our tired shoulders pressuring pressuring us 
to go cultivate our gardens, sort out our trash and eco compost the leftovers of this macabre feast, managing the phasing out of nuclear power, excess CO2 in the atmosphere, melting glaciers, hurricanes, academic epidemics, global overpopulation, erosion of the soil, mass extinction of living species. This will be our burden, they tell us. Everyone must do their part. And if we want to save our beautiful model of civilization, we have to consume just a little less to be able to keep consuming. We have to produce organically to keep producing. We have to control ourselves to go on controlling. This is the logic of the world straining to maintain itself while giving itself an air of historical rupture. This is how they would like to convince us to participate in the great industrial challenges of this century. And in our bewilderment, we're ready to leap into the arms of the very same ones who uh, presided over the devastation in hopes that they will get us out of it. Ecology isn't simply the logic of a total economy. It's a new morality of capital. I need to hold on. Take a note here. The system's internal state of crisis of the rigorous screening that is underway to demand a new criterion in the name of which this screening and selection will be carried out from one era to the next. The idea of virtue has never been anything but an invention of vice. Without ecology, how could we justify the existence of two different diets? One healthy and organic for the rich and their children, and the other notoriously toxic for the plebe whose offsprings are damned to obesity. The planetary hyper-bourgeoisie wouldn't be able to make its normal lifestyle seem respectable if its latest whims weren't so scrupulous, scrup, scrupulously respected uh, respectful of the environment. Without ecology, nothing would have enough authority to gag every objection to the exorbitant progress of control, tracking, transparency, certification, eco taxes, environmental excellence, and the policing of water will give us an idea of the coming state of ecological emergency. Everything is permitted to a power structure that bases its authority in nature and in health and in well-being. Once the new economic and behavioral culture has become common practice, coercive measures will doubtlessly fall into disuse on their own accord. You'd have to have all of the ridiculous aplomb of a TV crusader to maintain such a frozen perspective and at the same breath incite us to feel sufficiently sorry for the planet to get mobilized while remaining anesthetized enough to watch the whole thing with restraint and civility. The new green aestheticism is precisely the self-control that is required of us all in order to negotiate rescue operations where the system has taken itself hostage henceforth. It is in the name of environmentalism that we must tighten all of our bets, just as we did yesteryear in the name of the economy. The roads could certainly be transformed into bicycle paths or we ourselves could perhaps to a certain degree be grateful one day for guaranteed income, but only at the price of entirely therapeutic existence. Those who claim that the generalized self-control will spare us from environmental dictatorship are lying. The one who will prepare the way for the other and we will end up with both. As long as there is a man and environment, the police will be there between them. So I know we're running long, but I have a lot of shit to say. <laughs> um, you can see, like, just in the last circle, they were talking about the economy. And in this circle, they're saying the same shit, just with 
slightly different terms in a different context about the environment, right? Now, we know that this book is written by a bunch of Frenchmen, at least one Frenchman. Okay, it was written by a French dude, probably, in his basement. <laughs> this fucking olive drab <laughs> fucking communist bullshit on. But let me take it one step further. Let me just jump. Let me just jump ahead real quick. I don't think that this book does this. No, I don't think so. Anyhow, um, but just think about what the, the next chapter could be. If this was a book about America, right? Think about what the next chapter could be. They're using these things to frame a discussion about how awful and insidious the economy is. And then they use the same terms, different contexts to talk about how awful environmentalism is. Think about the next chapter could be all about, you know, what are the buzzwords we're hearing right now? Systematic races, racism of the, the United States. I 100% completely am on to the game. I'm on to the game. You go sign into the mailing list and go read that burning down on the American plantation. You, this is, this is it, bros. This is it. This is showing that, I mean, it's showing a lot, right? I've really been not talking a lot about it, but it shows how they will use anything to advance this agenda. They'll use anything to advance. I mean, literally they're using anarchy to advance their communist agenda. Right. And you're like, that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. I mean, it, it does, it does, it does. I'm trying not to get too preachy. I just wanted this material to speak for itself for the most part back to it. We still have a little bit to go I'm fucking running long. I'm tired. I gotta go make spaghetti. <sighs> Everything about the environmentalist discourse must be turned upside down where they talk of catastrophes to label the present systems mismanagement of beings and things. We only see a catastrophe of its all too perfect operation. The greatest wave of famine ever known to the tropics, 1876 to 1879 coincided with a global drought, but more significantly it coincided with the apogee of colonialization. Shit. I should have just waited. The destruction of the peasants world, and of local alimentary practices meant to dis dispense of the means for dealing with the scarcity more than the lack of water. It was the effect of the rapidly expanding colonial economy that littered the tropics with millions of emancipated corpses. What is presented everywhere as an ecological catastrophe has never stopped being, above all, a manifestation of a disastrous relationship to the world. Inhabiting a nowhere makes us vulnerable to the slightest jolt in the system, to the slightest climatic risk. As the latest tsunami approaches and the tourists continue to frolic in the waters, the islands, the hunter-gatherers rushed away from the coast following the birds' environmentalism's present paradox is that under the pretext of saving the planet from desolation, it merely saves the cause from desolation. The normal functioning of the world serves to hide our state of truly catastrophic dispossession. What is called a catastrophe is no more than the forced suspension of the state. One of those rare moments when we regain some sort of presence in the world. Let the petroleum reserves run out earlier than expected. Let the international flows that regulate the tempo of the metropolis be interrupted. Let us suffer from a great social disruption and some great return to savagery of the population, a planetary threat, the end of civilization, whatever. Any loss of control would be preferable to all of the crisis management scenarios they envision. When this comes, the specialists in sustainable development won't be the ones with the best advice. 
It's within the malfunctions that the short circuits of the system will find the elements of response whose logic will be to abolish the problems themselves. Among the signatory nations to the Kyoto Protocol, the only countries that have fulfilled their commitments in spite of themselves are Ukraine and Romania. Guess why? The most advanced experimentation with organic agriculture on a global level has taken place since 1989 on the island of <laughs> Cuba. Guess why? And it's along the African highways, nowhere else. The auto mechanics have been elevated to a form of pop art. Guess how? Well, I know the answer, but I'm just going to stick to the book. What makes the crisis desirable is that the crisis, the environment ceases to be the environment. We are forced to reestablish content, contact, albeit a potentially fatal one with what's there to rediscover the rhythms of reality. What surrounds us is no longer a landscape, a panorama, a theater, but something to inhabit, something we need to come to terms with, something we can learn from. We won't let ourselves be led astray by the ones who brought about the catastrophe with the managers platonically discussing among themselves how they might decrease emissions without breaking the bank. The only realistic option we can see is to break the fucking bank as soon as possible. And in the meantime, take advantage of every collapse in the system to decrease our own strength. New Orleans, a few days after Hurricane Katrina, in this apocalyptic atmosphere, here and there, life is reorganizing itself in the face of an inaction of the public authorities who were too busy cleaning up the tourist areas of the French Quarter and protecting shops to help the poorer city dwellers forgotten forms are reborn. In spite of occasional strong arm, I don't agree with any of what he just said, by the way, and not, I'm not a bootlegger for Bush. That's just not what happened. In spite of occasional strong-armed attempts to evacuate the area, the uh, in spite of white supremacist lynch mobs. <laughs> God, here we go. A lot of people refused to leave the train. For the latter who refused to be deported like environmental refugees all over the country, and for those who came from all around to join them in solidarity, responding to a call from a former Black Panther self-organization came back to the fore. In the few weeks' time, the Common Ground Clinic was set up from the very first day. The variable uh, country hospital provided free and effective treatment to those who needed it, thanks to the constant influx of volunteers. For more than a year now, the clinic is still at the base of the daily resistance to clean sweep operations of government bulldozers, which are trying to turn that part of the city into a pasture to, uh, for property developers, popular kitchens, supplies, streets, medicines, illegal takeovers and construction of emergency housing, all this practical knowledge accumulated here and in this course of a life. Now found a space where it can be deployed far from the uniforms and sirens Whoever knew the penniless joy of those New Orleans, the penniless joy of these New Orleans neighborhoods. <laughs> it was a nightmare <laughs> before the, well, I guess not before the, before the catastrophe, their defiance towards the state and the widespread practice of making do with what's available wouldn't be at all surprised with what became possible there. On the other hand, anyone trapped in the anemic and atomized everyday routine of the residential deserts might doubt that such determination could be found anywhere anymore. Reconnecting with such gestures buried under years of normalized life is the only practical means of not sinking down with the world while we dream of an age that is equal to our own passions all 
All right. I'm John. This is the Abercast. Tarot cards, t-shirts, newsletter. Uh, I'll let Hilly tell you about the rest of them. Thank you for listening to this episode. Send an email or visit us on social media to let us know what you think about this topic. And please remember to leave a five-star rate and review. Hey, did you learn something? Did you laugh? Supporting me is a way for you to be a part of the Abercast and ensure its growth and sustainability. It also means I can create a normal schedule for shows and bonus shows, as well as the exclusive Fellow Craft episodes. By supporting the show, you are not only a listener, but you are a part of the show. You supporting the show gives me a way to offer fun rewards as a thank you for showing your appreciation and support for our projects. Do you have an idea for a reward that you don't see? Let me know. My supporters are my partners. I currently pay for you to listen to the Abercast. Not only do I pay the hosting bills out of my own pocket, I volunteer my time and uh, talent to each and every episode of the Abercast. The price of books, the time and resources of reading and researching, the massive amounts of gin and tonic needed, the equipment it takes to record the shows, the time and resources it takes to create the bonus material, and the cost to maintain the internet presence. Is it worth your support? I don't know. I'm proud of the Abercast, and I feel like I'm improving all the time. In addition uh, to creating the show, that you dig and that you are excited about. I also have a full-time commitment and other obligations. So why financial support? All of the supporters help me focus my time in on the quality and development of the podcast. And what if you can't afford, you know, $1 or $3 or $10 or whatever a month? Believe me, I get that. There are many degrees of support, but if you can't support the show financially, please consider leaving a five-star rate and review on your preferred podcast app. And don't forget that you can sign into the mailing list and still unlock a lot of bonus content. Thank you. I cannot put into words how much it means to me that you listen to the show each time I post a new episode. Your feedback support and love of the stories that we talk about here is what keeps me going.